to James chapter 5. We're, we're coming close to the end of this series, uh, going through the book of James. We actually have one more week left. We're, we're not going to do it next Sunday because of Easter, but we will finish that up the last, uh, the, the next Sunday after Easter, and we'll, uh, it's, it's hard to believe we, we've made it through this book, and it's been good for me. Hopefully it's been good for you um, and challenging to me, and um, and we've just been hidden in every single verse through the book of James. We're into chapter 5. We'll hit part of chapter 5 today. And then in two weeks, we'll hit the second part of chapter 5. And, and it's just been really good, like I said. And, and today, though, we're talking about injustice. And injustice is a terrible thing. And it's always worse when it happens to you. Right? We don't like that when injustice happens. And what we want is justice in our lives, especially when we receive injustice. We want justice to happen. And so James is dealing with this topic here in the beginning of chapter 5, and he's actually not taking this topic lightly. He's hitting it really, really hard. If you have your Bibles open, James chapter 5, let's just, hit, let's just look at verse 1 to start here this morning. And he says here, as he's writing this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Ch James chapter 5, verse 1, he says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. What a great way to start a sermon, right? Woo! <laughs> But here we are. And so James, though he's, he's talked to the rich before in, his, in this letter, he hasn't talked to him like this yet. Like he, this is, he's like coming at the rich here in this part. He's saying, I need to get this point across to you that the injustices that you are a part of, that you are doing, are completely wrong. And so what we're going to see here in the Bible is that God's heart is a heart for justice. God's heart is a heart for justice. And so what is justice? Let me give you a definition of justice this morning. Well, justice is the fair treatment of others. Justice is giving people what they are due, whether it's punishment or protection. Looks like I'm losing my battery here. I'm going to change that real quick as we go. Here we go. And so in the Bible, when it talks about and speaks about justice, it's always coupled with the serving of orphans, the serving of widows, the serving of the poor, and even the serving of the foreigner. We see this in Zechariah chapter 7, verse... Yeah. Okay, we'll go back one. Um, verse 9, he says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Render true judgments, show kindness and mercy to one another. Do not oppress the widow, the fatherless, the sojourner, or the poor, and let none of you dev devise evil against another in your heart. And James has already talked about uh, this in chapter 1. He said in chapter 1 that pure religion is this, that which serves the poor and the widow. Timothy Keller says that justice is caring for the vulnerable. And the Bible shows us that God's heart is for the vulnerable. His heart is a heart for the vulnerable. He's a heart for justice. And if you look at the first few books of the Bible, you see that God is, a, is calling a group of people out of Egypt. And out of this group of people, he's making them his own special group, right? He's, he's calling them out of slavery, which they were in, and he's calling them out of what well, really this slavery that was injustice towards them. An injustice was happening to them. And he wasn't just calling them out of this injustice, but he was going, he, he's giving them laws, and he wanted them to function within these set of laws that he's giving them. He wanted them 
them to be a special beacon to the world so that they could see as they looked into this nation what a people is to know God. What does a people look like to know God? And he says, not only am I calling you out, but I'm going to bless you as a nation. And he says, you were poor and you were victims of injustice, but I am going to bless you. And so he gave them land that was flourishing with milk and honey and flowing with milk and honey. He gave them flocks. He gave them all these things. And he says, I'm going to bless you so that you can bless people. Right? So that they could serve other people. And what we see here is the heart for justice and for the vulnerable was infused into the life of Israel. This is what God was doing with them. And God tells them in Leviticus, which is that book that we normally pass over, right? We try to ignore. But God says in Leviticus, he says that when you harvest your crops, I don't want you to harvest everything. I know it's yours, and I know you can harvest it all, but God says, I don't want you to harvest all of it. He says, I want you to leave some of it right around the edge because I'm going to send some poor people who are going to need that, and they're going to need that part of the harvest. Leave it. He even tells them that when they're picking grapes, and if you drop one of the grapes while you're picking it, just leave it there on the ground. Treat it like it was ordained by God that you drop this grape so that the poor can come and they can have it. And so we see here that serving the poor was at the center of God's heart, even way back in Leviticus with the laws that he gave. And so God was blessing Israel not just for them, but for others people. But what happened to the Israelite people? Well, they were just like any child. Now, children are good at sharing when they don't have anything. It becomes a lot harder to share when you have stuff, right? Like, hey, I don't have anything. You got two of those. Let's share. That's easy for the one, but not so easy for the other, right? That's the way it works. And so now the Israelites, they have land. They've got all these blessings. And they're just like those kids that don't want to share. And they said, you know what? I'm not sharing it. I'm not giving it away. And they said, this is my harvest. These are my flocks. And they, they, they said, I'm not going to use this to serve others and to help other people who are poor. And God said, that's, that's not what I intended here. And do you understand this morning that just because something is in the Bible and people lived a certain way in the Bible, that it doesn't mean that that was what God intended for people or commanded them to do? People have said that, you know, well, we see in the Bible that there were some people that had more than one wife, so God must have wanted it that way, that it's okay for us because those people did it. No, that was not the way God intended for people to live and for people to do. It's not what he wanted. And so the Bible sometimes just records some things that people did, and he wasn't okay with that. That wasn't his plan. That wasn't his ways. And when we get to the books about the prophets, you get into the prophets section of the Old Testament, God has the prophets tell the people that he's upset with them. Like, you guys aren't doing it right. And so they bring this message to the people that God says that I told you to share with what you have with the poor and you haven't done that and God says I told you that I was going to bless you and I did bless you and you were to use those blessings to bless others and you haven't done that and because of this God is upset God is angry we stay and look at Zechariah Verse, or chapter 7, verse 11, it says, But they refused to pay attention and turned a stubborn shoulder and stopped their ears that they might not hear. They made their hearts diamond hard, lest they should hear the law and the words that the Lord of hosts had sent by his spirit through the former prophets. Therefore, great anger came from the Lord of hosts. As I called, and they did not hear, they would not hear, so they called, and I would not hear, says the Lord of hosts. And I scattered them with a whirlwind among all the nations that they had not known, lest the land they left was desolate, so that no one went to and fro, and the pleasant land was made desolate. 
Did you hear what God said there to him through the prophets? You wouldn't listen to me, and so I didn't listen to you. Now your land, it's desolate because you wouldn't listen. That land that was a blessing has become a desolate. And see, God values the poor, and they were indifferent to them, and so God brought judgment on them. They weren't valuing what God values. God said to them, I have left you to to care for the poor and the widow and the foreigner, and you didn't do this. You didn't value what I value, God says, and so I'm going to judge you because of that, because you didn't take care of what I wanted you to take care of. And so this is why James here in verse 1 is saying this. He says, come now, you rich, weep and howl for miseries, the miseries. He's telling them here, I don't just want you to be upset about this. I want you to cry over it. And I don't just want you to cry over this, but I want you to weep and groan over this. He's saying, I want you to feel to the bone, your very bones, the pain that I'm bringing upon you because you didn't listen to what I told you to do. And so why should they weep and howl? Well, it's because of the terrible troubles that were going to come their way. They were positioning themselves as enemies of God and enemies to what God desires. The heart of justice was infused into the heart of Israel. And you know what? It should be infused into the heart of every one of us who are followers of Jesus, who are Christians. It should be the very heart of the church just as Jesus was, just as God had called these people here. And so what are some of the enemies of justice that James shows us in these verses? And you see the first one up here. The first one's materialism. And James says that you've wrapped everything that you are around everything that you own. Your hope and your satisfaction is wrapped around your things, all that you have. And he tells them it's foolishness. He says that's foolishness. Look at verse 2, James 5. He says, your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you. And you will eat and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasures in the last days. And so he says in those verses, rotted, moth-eaten, corroded, right? He says these things that you're putting your faith and your hope in are all temporary things, the things that won't last. And so that's why it's foolish. They didn't recognize that the things that they were putting their hope in have an end to them. They won't last forever. And so to treat those things that won't last forever as if they do last forever is foolishness. And James says that you've hoarded your treasures. He's saying you're hoarding the things that that weren't meant to stop with you. They're meant to go through you to the good for the good of other people, to help other people out. And your hoarding will be evidence of your condemnation. And why condemnation here? Well, he says that, that, that you've hoarded these treasures in the last days. He's saying that there's a time factor with all of this here, that the people were ignoring. The last days are that period of time between Jesus' first coming and the time that Jesus comes again, his second coming, right? And so the last days, he says, you're choosing to hoard when you're, you should be more urgent with the time that's left on the clock. You should see and read what's left in time, and you should be working appropriately. And so we need to treat these last days as if they're quickly approaching us. The problem is, is we aren't playing the game as if we should be, is the way it should be played. Have you ever noticed at the end of a football game or a basketball game when the clock's getting close to the end, it's the last quarter getting towards the end? The teams begin to take extra care of the ball. They work a lot harder than they had been in the game earlier. They're trying to score way more than they were at the beginning. They sprint instead of jogging to each place. It's because they recognize and they see that the game is almost over, and in order to win this game, they need to make the most of every opportunity until it comes to an end. They're playing according to the time left on the clock. 
And the last days are quickly approaching us, and we should be urgent to do what God is calling us to do. We should be urgent to do and helping out the less fortunate. We should be urgent to help those in need. We need to be able to, we need to also be sharing the good news of Jesus, because that's what matters ultimately. But there's an urgency that God has called us to because we're living in the last days. And James tells the rich to weep and groan because Jesus will return. Amen. And when Jesus comes, he came before, the first time when he came, he was gentle person. When he comes again, he's coming in judgment. When he comes back, it's, it's a very serious deal if we're not his. And he says, I'm coming back because I expected you to put things the way I wanted them to be, to help those in the less fortunate, to serve those in need. And then James points out another issue for us here, and it's the issue of, there it is, indifference. Look at verse 4. He says, Behold the wages of the laborers who, who, uh, who uh, mowed your fields, who, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you, and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. Now, at this time, landowners were to pay their laborers, especially the day laborers, every single day. You didn't wait another day or a week. You paid them every day for their work. And if the worker did not get paid at the end of the day, his family did not eat. They'd go hungry. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 13 tells us, you shall not oppress your neighbor or rob him. The wages of a hired worker shall not remain with you on, all night until the morning. And so the issue that he's talking about here is that they've devalued their workers. You're not giving much to those who are helping you get rich and make money. And if you don't think that that's an issue today, I mean, look at some of our top companies and how they treat their employees. Maybe even some of these top companies that are in our country, they're treating their employees outside of our country, right? This isn't a far off issue for us because it's happening in companies in our country today. And James is saying you ought to take care of your workers. He's saying the more money you have, the more generous that you should be. And so what James is doing here is he's pointing to them to the fact that they're not growing with their generosity. If you make more, then you should give more. Actually, the statistics tell us the opposite of that is happening. The poorer people are the ones who are giving more than the rich. So we see through statistics and giving. That the more money you make as a, as a nation, the more money we make as a nation, the less we are giving, the more we're keeping for ourselves. And from that, we grow in our indifference to those around us when we do that. It just builds this indifference in us. But this is when we should be caring more for others, where we look to see and how we can help those around us. Randy Alcorn, pastor, says, God prospers me not to raise my standard of living, but to raise my standard of giving. And God gives us so that we might be able to give to others. God cares for the poor and the vulnerable, and he's saying we should care for them as well. Martin Luther King Jr. said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We must not be indifferent to those around us and we can become so individualistic that we don't think that it's our problem it's somebody else's problem it's their problem where they're at and as a Christians and as a church we need to function in that role we need to take care of each other we need to care of each other here in our in our church and care of those outside and the concern for justice should be infused in everything that we do and there are people that are hurting that we need to care about. And so the weight of James' statement is, is that we should be looking for injustices that we can fix. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 31 tells us, Whoever oppresses a poor man insults his maker, but he who is generous to the needy honors him. And so this issue here isn't just about helping about another person, but it's a statement of how we view God and who we see him to be. Now let's talk about, real quickly here, what happens if you're on the receiving end of injustice? 
Well, James tells us here that we're to have hope because there's a hope for justice. There really is. Look at verse 7. He says, Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth. Be patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. So he tells us to be patient here. He uses a farmer as an example. Now the farmer works hard, he works the ground, he plants the seed, and then what does he do? He waits, right? He trusts with everything that he has that God will come through with the rain that he so needs for his crops. And a patient hope is one that's filled with trust. James is encouraging us here that we need to trust and rest in the coming of Jesus, that he will return again. The second coming of Jesus should put fear in the lives of those who cause injustice, and it should bring peace to those who are facing injustice. The overwhelmed focus of this chapter is the second coming of Jesus. You see it in verse 3, he says, the last days. Verse 7, he says, until the coming of the Lord. Verse 8, he says, the coming of the Lord is at hand. And verse 9, he says, the judge is standing at the door. James doesn't give us a chart here, you know, to see when this is all going to happen. This is how, he doesn't give us that to explain the day of the return of the Lord. He just states it as fact. Jesus is coming again. And the promise of the return of Jesus should help us to persevere when we're going through problems and hardships in our lives. Because Jesus will rightly judge every person. Incidentally, did you know that there are over 300 references in the New Testament to Jesus' return? So if you do the math, that's one out of every 13 verses in the New Testament that talks about the return of Jesus. And so we must live every single day with the realization that Jesus could return at any moment. He could come back any time. We're to live with an alert expectation of his any moment return. And if you feel like you're at the bottom and there's no way up, if you feel like you've been forgotten, he says the coming of the Lord Jesus should bring peace to your hearts. You should look to his coming with rejoicing and anticipation. He says, fortify your heart with this. Fortify your heart with this. How do we fortify our hearts? Well, we do it with the Word of God. It's the Bible. The Bible fortify, fortifies our hearts. And James is saying, if you want an example, look to the prophets. Look to the prophets. Look at verse 10, James 5. It says, An example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you've seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. You think about the prophets. Think about Isaiah. He was told that by God that I'm going to send you to a people who will not listen to you, and they won't believe what you say. That's exciting, right? Here you go. Go off. They're not going to listen to you. They won't believe you. And God said, go. And Isaiah said, all right, I'll go. I'll do. I'll speak. What about Jeremiah, right? Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet. He, prayed, he preached faithfully for several decades. Several decades. And he only had negative responses toward him. Nobody encouraged him. All these negative responses. He spoke out against the false prophets who told the people only what they wanted to hear. He never lost sight of who God was and what God wanted them to hear, the people. And so he was facing conspiracy throughout his ministry. He faced imprisonment. He faced loneliness and even faced the fear of death. And you might think, well, why would Jeremiah keep doing this for decades? Well, even Jeremiah went through those same kind of thoughts, those times of doubt. He said, God, I'm here because you seduced me to this. You deceived me, and I'm here, and I don't want to do this anymore. I'm done with this. But then he changes his mind. He says, you know what? I can't stop, though. I just can't stop. I've got to keep on going. Why? 
Why did he have to keep on going? Well, he wrote these words in Jeremiah 20, verse 9. And he says, if I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, there is in my heart, as it were, a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I'm weary with holding it in, and I cannot. He says, if I stop, it'll hurt. I've got to preach. I've got to get the word of God out. It must go forth. And God's purposes are always worked out over periods of time. And although we do the work sometimes, the harvest depends on God giving the needed blessing. The crop is worth waiting for. In fact, in verse 7, it's called precious fruit. The verse 7 tells us how long we're to wait to be patient here. He says, until the coming of the Lord till the coming of the Lord. And so patient hope is to say, God, your glory is bigger than my pain. God, your glory is bigger than my injustice. Your glory is bigger than me being forgotten and me being a victim. You see, the prophets kept preaching no matter what, and they made a decision. They said, though I may be a victim of injustice, I will never be a participant of it. And it's easy for us to be victims and do what James says we shouldn't do, and that's to grumble and complain. Look at verse 9. James 5 verse 9 says, Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. When we begin to grumble and complain, we go from being the victims of injustice to the vehicle of injustice. When things aren't going well, when we are being oppressed or persecuted or we're just having a stressful week, it's easy to take it out on somebody else, especially those closest to us. When we're irritated, we tend to attack other people. And I have the tendency sometimes to blame others, to point out their deficiencies, taking notes on someone and what they do or what they don't do when I'm hurting. See, when we hurt, we often hurt others. We become fault finders, nitpickers, instead of encouragers. And James says we shouldn't do that. Do you have any bitterness that's growing within you? Do you find yourself resenting other people, even if they're not really totally responsible for the pain that you're feeling? Do you feel that towards them? Our internal backbiting and bickering and grumbling and groaning, what it does is it knocks us off of mission. We don't do what God wants us to do. We get toward something else. And when we feel like our Christian values are being threatened and there's an injustice that's happening and we grumble and complain about it. And James tells us we shouldn't do that. Don't grumble and don't complain in your injustices because you become, it's so easy for us to become the vehicle for injustice when we grumble and complain. But he tells us there's a purpose-filled hope here. James uses the example of Job. He says in verse 11, Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. And James is saying there is a purpose in your pain. There's a purpose in your season of injustice. There's a purpose in your season of difficulty because of that because there's a purpose we are then to have a purpose filled hope we saw this back at the beginning of James right the first chapter James chapter 1 Verse 2 tells us, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. He says your season of injustice will produce in you endurance and strength. It's producing in you a completeness that you would never have if you didn't go through that situation. 
And so what we need to do is to walk through that season. But it's not just because there is a greater purpose in all of this. He says, think about Job. The main purpose that you go through these situations and these times is so that you will see God more clearly. In fact, we see in Job chapter 42, verse 2, it says, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. And then he says in verse 5, I've heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I despise myself and I repent in dust and ashes. You see, God taught Job in the midst of his injustices, in the midst of his pain, it was in those moments that he saw God more clearly. He saw God for who he really was. It's in those times where, where God cleans our eyes more thoroughly. It's when we see him more glorious and more beautiful than we've ever seen him before. And that's what the prophets saw. That's what Job eventually saw through everything he went through. He saw that, God, you are worth it. Job Job said, I see you, God. I, I see you in your beauty, who you really are. And Jesus, when he came to earth, he was poor. He identified with those who were poor. He lived this perfect life that we never lived, right? We could not live. We've made mistakes, but Jesus lived a perfect life. But then he was denied justice. And in his trial and crucifixion, he was denied justice. And if you believe that you've been denied justice in your life, Jesus relates to you. And in this time, you may see him more clearly. He so identified himself with you that he didn't hoard riches, even though he had every right to collect everything to himself. But he gave it all away to the point of death so that we could know God more fully. We need to focus on the character of God. And God invites us to focus on him when we're prone to be hoarders and to grab everything we can to ourselves. And sometimes when we just go within and we don't go to help anybody else, we're just there with ourselves. Or when we want to give up or when we want to lash out at somebody. God not only called us to him, but he makes a beautiful promise to us. Because the end of verse 11, he says there that the Lord is compassionate passionate and merciful, full of mercy. And God will give us a heart of compassion and a heart of mercy. And when we wrestle through this reality that sometimes we do love money more than other people and that we all are different and we struggle with these things, he says our, hope, our situation isn't hopeless or helpless, that I can give you a heart and I can change you. But it all starts with us repenting. And we need to come to terms with the reality of who we are. And so to wrap this up this morning, I just want to give you a few questions that I want you to just look at. And I want you to take before the Lord this morning. They're going to be here up on the screen. And as we close this morning, I want to ask you these questions. And our musicians can come right now, if you would. The questions we need to ask ourselves this morning, how are you using what God has given you to care for the vulnerable? How are you allowing God to work in your situation? Whatever it is that you're facing, are you allowing God to work? Are you hoping and trusting in him? If you're in pain or your situation, a situation here that you feel like you're not getting justice, are you letting God bring hope to you? Are you allowing God to work in that situation? Or are you grumbling and complaining and helpless and hopeless? See, God wants to bring hope in your life. God wants to bring rejoicing in your life, even in the midst of the hardship, because he is in control. He loves you, and he's working, and he will return one day. And so would you just take a moment to ask these questions with the Holy Spirit here? Say, God, where, where am I? Do I need to, to repent this morning? Do I need to come to you because I haven't been a heart for the vulnerable, the needy? Or I've been facing some injustices in my life and I'm just grumbling and complaining over these things and it's causing me to lash out toward others. 
are you this morning? And as our musicians sing, will you just take this time to pray to God and seek him?